this movie is the platonic ideal of neoconservatism. I don't think it's possible to make a movie any more neoconservative, any more rah-rah America, hurrah for democracy, overthrowing third world dictatorships, shoving in as many characteristics of America's enemies as possible to make the bad guys kind of this random amalgamation of evil. This is the single most neoconservative thing ever. And of course, it's made by Michael Bay. Now, as I've said in the past, Michael Bay is a very talented director. He just needs to be put on a leash. Someone needs to put him on a leash and smack him whenever he's doing something stupid. And this represents Michael Bay completely unleashed. This is where they gave him a huge budget. They're like, look, Mike, this is going to be a shitty Netflix movie. You can do whatever you want. Let your creativity run wild. And he produced Six Underground, which is as terrible as it sounds. To be perfectly honest, this probably could have been a pretty good comedy. This kind of feels like... No, actually, no, it couldn't have been a good comedy. He's like, Team America World Police is like a good comedic representation of neoconservatism. But like in order to parody something, you know, like they say in Tropic Thunder, you can't go full retard. This movie goes full retard. It's kind of like G.I. Joe in that aspect. But that being said, let's get into the movie. So the movie starts with perhaps the longest, most self-indulgent car chase scene I think I've ever seen in my entire life. It goes on for like 20 minutes. Nothing is established. Nothing's explained. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Rapid cuts. Banter between characters we don't care about. For some reason, Ryan Reynolds has the op like the eye that's dangling from like the optical nerve of some dude who turns out to be the lawyer of the four generals, but we'll get to that in a minute. So I don't they kill this lawyer. I don't really know why they kill him because he was the lawyer of like the bad guys. And I guess like as part of neoconservatism, lawyer uh bad guys don't have the right to legal representation. Um so if you represent them, then you get sent to Guantanamo Bay, I guess. Because part of spreading democracy and civil and human rights is not letting people have their day in court and not letting them have legal representation, which I think explains a lot. But he has the optical nerve thing, and he uses it to unlock the guy's cell phone, and then he gets the location of the four generals. So then we're treated to a series of like flashbacks and flash-forwards. And we get this really awkward like line where Ryan Reynolds says, Do you know what happens when you die? I do. You become a ghost. And I actually thought it was like a fantasy horror movie for a while until he later explains that he doesn't mean ghost literally. So yeah, like I said, it's just it's purely a metaphorical title. So Ryan Reynolds is one and he invented neodymium, neodymium, however you pronounce it, magnets and most of the components that make up modern cell phones. So he's got billions and billions of dollars. So he witnessed some evil stuff happening in the Central Asian nation of Turkestan. And because of that, he decided that he was going to go full neocon. I think probably what happened is he like read the project for the New American Century after he went to Turkestan. He's like, we need to bring democracy to this place. So he faked his own death and he became number one. So then he recruited another five people who are all from like sketchy backgrounds and they only refer to each other as numbers because it's, it's like the double O system, I, I guess. They're just numbers now. They're like the numbered areas in um, Code Geass, I guess. And none of them know each other's first names. So in the opening like car sequence, and if this sounds disjointed, it's because this movie is disjointed. Um, number six dies, so they have to recruit number seven. And number seven is like the most cringy, like jingoistic neocon thing ever. So there's like, uh, he's like a black uh, Delta Force's Delta Force sniper, which actually kind of reminds me of a book I read about one, but uh, a guy like that. But that's neither here nor there. So he is like. He, there's like a civilian truck or something that's coming up to like a checkpoint with his other Delta Force people. And he's like, they're 
they're terrorists in there. I know they're terrorists in there because they're so inept. They misspelled UN on their like fake aid vehicle. Like on the aid vehicle, it's NU because they're that inept. He's like, can I shoot them? They're like, no, hold your fire, soldier. We have to abide by international treaties. He's like, but I want to I wanna save my, man, my men. And it's, it's for America. But he holds his fire and his squad gets killed. And he suffers from like severe survivor's guilt. So Ryan Reynolds recruits him and he's like, you can serve America. They don't actually say serve America, but it's, it's basically the plan. You can help us make the world a better place and safe for democracy. So then there's these four generals. It's never explained who they are or why they're important. It's like a video game plot. They're like, we have to kill the four generals. And if we kill the four generals, then the regime of Roja, Rovash Elamov will collapse. Because no one else in the country is loyal to him other than the four generals. And like they're also involved in buying sarin nerve gas. For like from like Iraq or Iran or so, I don't think it's really explained. So they're they're the like we're buying the sarin nerve gas. It's going to be used against our own people. I mean that's that's what he's going to do. He's getting nerve gas, specifically sarin nerve gas to use against his own population. This this sounds vaguely familiar. So let's just talk about Turkestan for a minute. So it's in Central Asia. But they call the president, they call Rovich, Rovash El Presidente or Presidente. And the big holiday there is the Day of the Dead. The architecture is like a weird mix of like Soviet era and like Dubai and like Middle Eastern. It's, it's like this uh, just other Middle Eastern. It's really, really weird. So yeah, and it's just a generic evil military dictatorship. The, the villain, like, he's not even a communist. He's not, like, a fake nationalist. He's not a populist. He has no, like, political ideology other than being evil and ruling the country brutally and embezzling money. So he has a brother who, for some reason, he keeps imprisoned in Hong Kong. Don't ask me why. And the plan is they're going to go to Hong Kong. They're going to get his brother because his brother loves democracy and human rights. They literally say his democracy loving brother and we're going to put him in power and it's going to become like America. So they like go to Hong Kong and we have another like hour long action sequence that's kind of really boring. A lot of this movie is literally them just like running and one shotting everybody with like heat seeking bullets basically is just how like unrealistic it is and i get that it's dumb to complain about realism in the michael bay movie but if there's no tension whatsoever like if the the are alleged heroes so they they like recruit the brother and the brother's like no i won't do it i won't replace one tyrant with another i refuse to become the leader of the country and at one point they refer to him as like taking the throne so i don't know if that was metaphorical or it was supposed to be like they had set up a monarchy that was also, I don't know, it's just part of the random amalgamation of evil. Now, the subtitles say that Turkestan, they speak Turkmen as their language, so I guess it's supposed to be Turkmenistan. Who the hell knows? Michael Bay doesn't know geography. That's why, this, that's why it's called El Presidente, and it's on the Day of the Dead in Central Asia. Might as well be Zanzibar land in Central Asia and Outer Heaven in south africa oh wait that happened in metal gear so like there's some bonding and stuff which isn't really interesting so they hack state-run television which they're like it's it's the heart lifeblood of any regime is state-run television it should be privatized and given to american companies they'll be able to run it in like a completely non-partisan non-biased way not like state propaganda television so despite his like insistence that he wasn't going to overthrow his brother the brother decides to overthrow his brother and does this really fucking lame speech about how they have to rise up and um, overthrow him and bring democracy back. And immediately the people rise up to bring democracy back. There's like, as Hillary Clinton would put it, there's a spontaneous demonstration. Literally everybody in like every city in the country like gets out banners like democracy, freedom, down with Rovash. All this stuff because the Americans have come. 
And the Americans have brought the message of democracy. And democracy is going to happen. So Rovach's um, response to this is he's like, okay, so what we're going to do is the people are our enemy now. Not like the specific movement, not my brother, not the ghosts. The people at large are the enemy. So what we're going to do is we're going to destroy Turkestan's infrastructure. We're going to sarin gas hospitals and we're going to sarin gas schools. And because this is the way that they think like that Assad works. Like it's obvious with the, like the nerve gas and, and like the dictator facing the civil, like this is supposed to be, and there's like a huge number of refugees on the border. I think there's like a million refugees who fled his regime. It's obvious that this is supposed to be a parallel to the Syrian civil war. But, like, Assad didn't behave in that way. Um, Assad had a sizable, I believe the majority of the army stayed loyal to him, and his goal was to reconquer parts of the country that were occupied by ISIS and the um, other Syrian rebels. And they've kind of come to terms with the Kurds. So, like, people don't behave like this in real life. Even, like, with Saddam, there was only a certain couple of the, uh, the Marsh Arabs and the Kurds that he bombed but he did have his core base. And there was, generally speaking, a specific political objective. But in this case, he's like, I'm just going to destroy this country because I can. And for whatever reason, he decides he's not going to do that. So he goes and he gets on his yacht and he's going to go away on his yacht now. So I don't know if they're like on the Caspian Sea or like where the hell, maybe it's the Aral Sea. Oh no, wait, the Aral Sea got destroyed by the Soviets. I don't know. Maybe it's like it's maybe it's like Bacal. It could be like Bacal for I know. Who the fuck knows? This movie makes no sense. So we have this like action scene where they attack the boat, and when they're attacking the boat, the guy turns the boat into a giant magnet and uses it as a way to defeat all of the like uh, presidential guard or I guess the Republican guard because they're wearing Kevlar and they have plastic guns. Whereas the Republican Guard are using like titanium and steel trauma plates and metal guns. So they keep getting sucked against the walls. I think the funniest part of this movie is how much collateral damage there is and how nobody gives two fucks about how much collateral damage there is. Like because of the magnet going off, it shows like dozens of just random kitchen staff and like servers and maids and stuff getting like graphically butchered by like knives and shit. And and they don't care. They're just like, oh, okay, it's just a sacrifice for democracy. And then, like, the brother goes up to the military and he's like, can't we all just get along? And the military is immediately like, yeah, that guy was an asshole. We love America, too. So they side with him. So they get Rovash and they take him. Like, they get the ship is sinking, but they get saved by the brother who's piloting a helicopter and i'm like how the fuck did he get from the military hq to there in like two minutes and why is he going like isn't he important why is he putting himself in danger i don't know just for drama so they fly to the border and they throw rovash to the refugees who eat him i, I think it's kind of implied and at the end they're like so long as the enemies of democracy are like are still like Rome. We're gonna have to like keep trying to to take them down and, and continue to spread spread freedom throughout the world. So I don't know if he was like thinking he was gonna have a sequel to this piece of shit. I don't know why they gave him hundred and fifty million dollars. I don't know how Netflix thinks they're gonna make the money back. None of this makes any kind of sense. Um. This movie was pure garbage. I mainly focused on how lame, like, the neoconservative pro-American thing is. But this movie is just fucking terrible in every other way. I guess there's, like, some attractive women in it. But they have this really gratuitous, yet somehow unsatisfying sex scenes in it. And they have, like, multiples of them. And they kind of happen at just weird points in the movie. Um, the editing is, is atrocious. The action scenes are like over the top in a bad way and lame. And it somehow takes itself like really seriously, despite theoretically being like, I don't actually know. I don't think it is supposed to be a comedy. Oh no, it is an action comedy. Sorry. But it takes itself really seriously. So this movie is complete and total garbage, but it's, it's fascinating in a way. And it might be a, might be worth a watch if you want to just 
Like, if someone's like, what is neoconservatism? Just show them this movie. Because this is neoconservatism in its purest platonic form. 